I want to start, actually, uh, before I get into the science um, about depression, I want to say a word because, um, as it was alluded to, I worked for 12 years in Europe. And I left uh, being the chair of a department in the United States because I was very discouraged with our ability to treat the patients that David and Dr. Light showed you lying on the street with their crates the homeless psychotic patients. And um, one of the problems we have in this country is, what do you think the three biggest treatment facilities for the mentally ill are in the United States? Yeah. Correct. Cook County, Rikers Island, and the Los, Los Angeles County Jail. And we have to change that. And that is a question, I think, of political will. And, and I think we can do much better. Uh, so that's the first thing I want to say. And I want to say, when you change that, we were able in Germany to create in an industrial setting of relatively low-income people, a, a catchment area of a quarter of a million people, we were able to get the treatment to, out to the people who needed it to the point where we, after one week using eight social workers, 12 hours a night, were able to find one homeless psychotic patient. So it can be done, and the costs in the end are not higher. So that's my proselytizing. Now for the science, which is quite different. And it's going to take off from where Wayne was. And my goal after leaving Germany, where I was doing clinical work, <clears throat> was to see, could we develop new, more effective treatments? And I'm interested in depression, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about how, uh, how we approach that. I have no disclosures. I'm not working with any companies at the moment. And my funding is from the Simons Foundation. And the NARSAD fellows were the postdocs on the Nature paper I'm going to tell you about. And we're very indebted to NARSAD for giving both of them fellowships. Um, so you've already seen this slide. And this is the lifetime prevalence of major depression. It is moving up as the leading cause of disability in the world. It's already the leading cause of disability in the world for women. Uh, and it's moving up. Uh, I think it's in third or fourth place now. And we figure by 2040, it will be the leading cause of disability for any medical condition in the world. So we've got to get better treatments. Um, and our, our treatments aren't so hot. Here we see them. A placebo will get about 30% better because it's a remitting illness. Some people get better. Effective psychotherapy, uh, cognitive psychotherapy is one example, can get you up to about half of the people better. Standard antidepressants used correctly uh, will get you up to about two-thirds. And we talked at the end, Wayne talked a little bit about ECT. That can get you up to 85%. But we still have 15% of people who seem to suffer from chronic depression are at very high risk for suicide. And suicide killed 40,000 people in this country last year. Every 13 seconds, there is a suicide. So this is something we really have to do better on. OK, what was our approach to try to get new treatments? It was to build an animal model which mim mimicked the symptoms. And we decided to take off from a model that was developed at Penn by Zeligman and Overmeyer working with Ted Beck, who was the person who developed cognitive psychotherapy, probably still one of the two most effective psychotherapies in depression. And the ideas were that if you lost cognitive control, uh, you would think the world was impossible and you wouldn't function very well. The, the animal model was very simple. You exposed rats to a stressor. In this case, there was an electric grid on the floor. And if they had no way of escaping that stressor for a period of time, not too long, uh, a group of them developed helplessness. That is, you put them into the same situation, you gave them a lever, which they only had to press. Um, and they would usually bump against this lever once or twice, jumping around with the electric grid. As soon as they learned they could press it, they would stop the shocks. And if you took 100 rats, you would get about 20 who were totally as good as controls, and a lot of them in the middle. And you'd have about 10 or 12 that wouldn't press the lever much at all. They never learned. So these were considered helpless rats. And what we did is 
we decided to add to that helplessness a genetic component. So we bred the helpless rats and saw that we increased the proportion of helplessness till we had an almost totally helpless strain and another strain without helplessness. So now we could look at genetics and we could look at environment. And that's what we wanted to do in this model. And we wanted to look at the pattern of uh, metabolic activity in these two sets of animals. And we did animal pet at Brookhaven National Lab, which I didn't put on my count, but I owe them because the Department of Energy funded this part of the study. And we looked at the resilient and the helpless, and we looked at differences. And one structure really hit us, this teeny little structure that Wayne told you I would talk about, the habenula. And when we looked at it, this was the most different structure between these two sets of animals. And so we wondered, what was its role? Now, the first thing you do if you find something that you never heard of, and I had never heard of the habenula, is you look in the literature. And what did we find in the literature? We'll just skip that one. What we found in the literature was in about 10 years ago, a group in London, a very good group with Ray Dolan, had looked at tryptophan challenge in depressed patients. And the tryptophan challenge is the following. If patients have responded to drugs such as Prozac, that means they're SSRI responders. If they've responded to those drugs, you take them off the drug and give them a mixture of amino acids that reduces tryptophan in their blood system very quickly over a matter of hours, their serotonin levels in the brain will go down. Those patients will redevelop depression. And what Ray Dolan did was do just that to a group of patients, and he looked to see, whoops, I'm sorry, I'm hitting the wrong button. He looked to see, oh, we're, you've seen the whole talk, we can quit now. <laughs> We'll get back there. No, we won't. We're going the wrong way. There we are. Uh, what he saw was that uh, only one structure lit up, and he was convinced this was the habenula. And he published it in a reasonable journal, Neuroimage, and I saw it was almost never referenced. So this was in the literature 10 years before we saw the same thing in our model, and it was in people. So you heard uh, Wayne mention Helen Mayberg, and there were two groups in the country who I think have done a lot, the most work on the circuits, and one is Wayne and, and his collaborators, uh, and the other is Helen and her collaborators. So I went to both of them, and I said, what do you think about this? Don't you, because you guys both do PET scans, I do PET scanning, I think this looks pretty good. Helen said, no chance, couldn't possibly measure the habenula, that's the thalamus. And I said, I'm not sure, Helen, I think that's the habenula. And Wayne said, well, maybe it's the habenula. Why don't we do it in a different way using arterial spin labeling? And that's what Wayne's group had a study going. So he did it, and he reproduced. This is basically telling you he reproduced the results of Morris, which says that when you get depressed, this little teeny structure turns on. Now, if that little teeny structure turns on, why is it so important? It turned out. Coincidentally, with all of these studies, a group at the um, NIH, in the I Institute of all things, Hikasaka and his co-workers, co were studying the habenula very carefully. And what they found was that the habenula mainly did one thing. It predicted reward. If the habenula turns on, you get no dopamine output and you get no reward. If the habenula turns off, you get a reward signal. So if something happens and your habenula turns off, you can feel a reward. If your habenula is on, you don't feel a reward. Well, we see a very active habenula in depression. And if one never feels a reward, one's obviously going to get a little depressed. So we thought this all made sense. And we wanted to see where did this habenula go? What went? So we did retrograde labeling in our animals. And sure enough, we implicated a lot of the circuit that Wayne just showed you. For example, there's a strong retrograde flow to the basal nucleus of the strio terminalis. Sounds weird, but what comes into this is the amygdala, and you heard all about the amygdala. So you've got the hippocampus going into the amygdala, going into the basal nucleus, going right into the habenula. That's an anxiety circuit. It's a circuit of emotion. 
The medial prefrontal cortex you heard a lot about, that gets activated with retrograde. And that's the area that Wayne has just been talking about. So we figured this might be a central point, and maybe if we could understand this point better, uh, we might be able to get better treatments. Now it turns out very recently, in an issue of Science only maybe three weeks ago, a collaborator of mine, this, I had nothing to do with this, but this is Robert Melano at, at uh, San Diego, UC San Diego, showed that there's also a large input from the globus pallidus to the lateral habenula, and if you get uh, a depressed animal, this input shifts so uh, there is less GABA and more glutamate, and so it shifts towards excitation, which again is consistent with everything we've seen that said if you excite this structure, you cause depressed mood. Now where does this structure go? What does it control? It turns out it controls the reward system in dopamine, it controls the serotonin system, and it interacts and controls in part the norepinephrine system, just those amines that we've been so concerned about in depression. So this is going to be a lot of fancy data slides, and on each of these I only want you to take one point away. The point here is simply that the habenula in the depressed animal, the congenitally depressed animal, is much too active. And that's the only point you really have to worry about on that slide. On this slide, if we if we use very high impulses, we take that overactive habenula and we depress it. Now, Wayne talked a bit about deep brain stimulation, and this gave us the idea that maybe the habenula would be a good target for deep brain stimulation. If we can depress this overactivity, can we cure the helplessness? And we looked at that in rats, and we found that we could. We could reverse helplessness in our animals if the electrode was precisely and exactly on the edge of the lateral habenula. If it were anywhere else, a little bit back in the thalamus, a little bit forward in the medial habenula, and I'm talking millimeters here, we got no activity. And so that led us to think that perhaps we had a new target for deep brain stimulation that might be better, but it would be very tricky. And so I'm going to give you one case report of our first case in Germany. This was done by a student of mine at, in Germany at, at the University of Heidelberg. Uh, and after he and I talked about this case quite a bit. And this was a woman I had already treated in Germany, and she was getting more and more ill. At this point, she was nearly 60 years old, and she had very severe depression with psychotic elements and suicidal ideation. And the depression came on very fast, and the suicidal ideation was so severe that we had to hospitalize her immediately. Luckily, she responded to ECT, electroconvulsive therapy. But unluckily, what started to happen is the periods between episodes got shorter and shorter. When they got to six days, I was already in the United States. Uh, and Dr. Sartorius wrote me and said, we can't do ECT anymore because we're going to ruin her memory. What are we going to do? Can we do DBS? And I said, I don't know whether you can do DBS. I think you need to invoke an ethics committee. You've got to get a local committee. And if they'll give you permission, you want to go to the lateral end of the habenula and see if you can stop it. So they, long story short, the patient, in a period of the six days when she was well, agreed. All of her family members, her children, and her husband agreed. We treated her with DBS, and for the first weeks we saw absolutely nothing, and we were really upset. Then we turned up the current. We really turned it up uh, to the point where we were scared, and all of a sudden her symptoms started to go away. They went away to the point where she was fully recovered. Then, being a good German housewife, she didn't use her car. She took her bicycle to go shopping. And she went out shopping and unfortunately got into an auto accident. The trauma surgeon who saw her, she wasn't that badly hurt, saw this funny thing in her chest, and he took it out. And of course, that was the battery. <laughs> Within 24 hours, from a Hamilton D of four, which is probably better than most of us, she was at a Hamilton D of 40, which is psychotically depressed. Put the battery back in, she got better. <laughs> 
I went back to Germany after two years and spoke with her husband, and this was probably the most moving clinical moment I've ever had. He said to me, you've given me back the woman I used to know. So the DBS really, in that case, worked perfectly. But it doesn't always work perfectly. We're doing a study at Sinai right now, and we're recruiting uh, patients. And, and uh, before I go on to this next part, let me just tell you about the first three. One of them is a responder. One of them is too early to say anything. And one is definitely a non-responder. And I think the problem is this neurosurgical technique, that's a tough structure to hit. And we have to be exactly there, and we have to have the electrode sending the signal in exactly the right place. And so we still have some work to do to get it perfect. But we will continue the study probably through six patients, and then try to uh, come up with the right coordinates and go for a multi-center international study to see whether this really works. Because as you heard, Helen's study, the large study, didn't quite make it uh, as a therapeutic uh, approach. It still works in some patients, but not in enough. So DBS is not the way to treat depressed patients. It's too difficult, too expensive, and too dangerous. Can we get better drugs? You've heard from Wayne the whole situation with glutamate. And the glutamate-GABA ratios are too high on glutamate. That's what all this stuff tells you. And that's what we found in the animals and what people have found in man. This is a figure from a paper by a friend of mine, George Nardoff, who's now in Canada. And what he showed basically in melancholic depressed patients using magnetic resonance spectroscopy that glutamate really is too high in the synaptic clefts, probably. It, it gets, it comes out in synapses from the neuron, and normally glutamate is taken back up immediately by a transporter and turned into glutamine. But this transporter isn't working right, apparently, in depression, and too much of this stuff sticks around. Now, what does ketamine do? Ketamine basically blocks glutamate. So this all sort of fits together, a little loosely if you look at the details, but it sort of fits together. What struck me about this was this transporter was discovered by me in 1970, and nobody believed it because we were saying that synaptic control could be affected by astrocytes, not by neurons. And now that standard knowledge. But in 1970, nobody believed it, so I was delighted that this transporter might play a role. And that gave me an idea for another kind of drug. Uh, so the first thing we did to, was take these congenitally helpless animals and look at the level of this particular transporter. And what we found is it's way down, specifically in that area of frontal cortex that Wayne pointed out was so important. What? Gotcha. I'm, I'm getting there. Uh, I might go over a little, you know. You guys willing to pass up two minutes for lunch? That's, yes. Okay. <laughs> See, I got four minutes now. <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> so, so, so what, uh, what we did was we saw that that decreased uh, this particular transporter exactly in the place where you didn't want too much glutamate in the synapse. What were the consequences of that? Well, we can go fast. What we did was we used a measure, PSD95, that tells you how many synapses are there. And we counted them in the cortex of animals with helplessness and without helplessness. And basically, what we showed in these animals was just what Wayne showed in that slide, that the number of synapses are down in the helpless animals. There are fewer. So, Here's a slide from Carlos Cerati, another previous member, because I don't do anything this fancy. And it's not going to work. Oh, it spins and deals. But what it shows you, basically, is that this glutamate comes out. It's removed by this transporter. And if it's activated properly, it builds new synapses through the AMPA receptor. If there's too much of it, it gets toxic. And, and that made us think that if we could make this receptor work better, which was missing, we might have a new drug. And so that's what we 
Oh, here we go, he's spinning. Here we go, they're all spinning, they're coming. Look at that, there are our new synapses and now we get learning memory and plasticity. I don't know why they didn't go the first time I was hitting the right button. So there you've seen it. So the requirements for a new antidepressant are to try to restore synaptic function and get rid of this excess glutamate. Um, a possible approach that we came up with, and this is when I, I did forget to say that some of my funding was from, for three years from the Department of Energy, and this was during the time I was at the Department of Energy. Uh, we managed to find a class of drugs which would induce the synthesis of the sodium ATPase. And these slides are too difficult. Um, and that class of drugs was dioxane. I want to go back there, I'm sorry. Uh, they, were, they were drugs that, that were barely used, but one of them is still on the market. This is a bad hypertensive drug. It's used for insulomas and, and can really distort the glucose in the brain, so you have to be careful with it, but it does very clearly relieve this learned helplessness at pretty high doses. We don't know whether we can get to this state in man. This was in rat. But we now have a study at the NIMH in the intramural program using this drug as a paradigm for developing this class of drugs as antidepressants, and Carlos Cerati and I are in the middle of that study. Uh, and the last thing I want to tell you, these are very technical slides, and I only want one point on each slide, is there's a possible way to create a perfect antidepressant if I'm right about the habenula. And the way we found that was doing proteomics, taking our two lines of animals, the ones that are never depressed and the ones that are always depressed, and growing them, one of them in N15, oh, one of them in N15, I'm sorry, I have a lot of trouble um, hitting the right button. One of them in N15 chow and one of them in N14 chow and then looking at the concentration of every protein in the brain. And mainly when we looked at the habenula, that's all I'm gonna tell you about, we found one protein really different that was functionally very important, that's beta-cam kinase. And when we looked at this beta-cam kinase, it seemed to be overactive, and that seemed to cause the depression. To test that, we did some very fancy molecular biology. We made a viral vector with green fluorescent protein so we could see where it went, and we added the gene for beta-cam kinase so that we could overexpress it. So we made too much of it here, and then we looked at the, at the animals, and perfectly normal animals all turned depressed, all of them. So then we said, do we have the perfect antidepressant? If we have the perfect antidepressant, we would block beta-cam kinase right there, and they ought to get better. Now, we can do this with the same genetic trick. We can make a viral vector that has the siRNA that knocks out beta-cam kinase, and we can eject it just in that part of the brain and what we do is we have this overactive animal that gets normalized and all the depressive symptoms go away. He is not helpless. He works perfectly fine on the swim, forced swim test. They do not have anhedonia, so these animals are normal. Now the problem is, how do we deliver this target only to the lateral portion of the lateral abenula? And at this point, I don't know the answer. This is a very important enzyme throughout the brain. It's used for LTP, learning and memory, and synaptic transmission. But if we could lower it just in that part of the brain, I think we could cure depression. So that's the story, and it's not done yet. Thank you. Thank you.